institutionalism one essentially had uh, was about was about um, uh, how given identities institutions can be designed political institutions can be designed which would moderate or aggravate tensions and conflict and when consociational theory emerged um, in the 60s and 70s an essentialist view of identities that's the important point an essentialist view of identities prevailed in line uh, with the temper of the times it was assumed that ethnic identities were fixed and appropriate political institutions were to be constructed in light of the fixity of identities right that's say leipart himself i showed you readily accepted that that was the view institutionalism too the more recent literature first of all believes in constructivist um understandings of of identity not in the essential fixity of identities so it shows how institutions can transform the salience of identities identities become consequences and institutions causes it was the other way around in institutionalism one right now this does not mean that identities should always be seen as consequences of institutions this does not mean that right what it does mean is that the relationship is two way the relationship goes in both directions right which institutions um, does the literature talk about well it's mainly a political science literature so it talks about party systems electoral systems state breakups and what they do to identities the most cited works in this recent vintage are by david leighton who worked on who's worked in many places in the world but his work on eastern europe is uh, quite important to this this uh, turn in institutional literature and daniel posner's work on africa now you should note um that um that um um for david leighton as we will see a few moments later um the break up of the soviet union and its impact on baltic states latvia estonia lithuania right was in many ways an a very uh, it was sort of key to understanding how identities change when institutions do so the book is called identities and formation hmm and the main argument we'll see in a moment and daniel posner uh, worked in zambia and malawi and Af africa in general and noticed that the institutional changes in africa which are institutional change unlike india where insti uh, india has had one constitution and a federal system which was put in place by 1960 on the basis of language right first past the post since 1952 right president presidential system no parliamentary system yes no change in that so india has had considerable institutional fixity hmm. whereas africa has gone through a lot of institutional changes from parliamentarianism to presidentialism from one party system to multi party system from fptp to pr so it is a fertile ground for understanding what institutions do to identities and it's not a question that can be as easily accessed in india though it can be and we'll see the indian examples so let's start with um, the african case Daniel Posner argued that since argues that since colonial times Zambians have had two 
axes of identification, language and tribe. There are four languages in Zambia, four language groups, and over six dozen tribes. These are the two main axes of, of identification. Since independence, Zambia has also had two kinds of overarching institutions, multi-party rule and one-party rule. Under multi-party rule, Zambians embraced language as their basic political identity, and under one-party rule, they choose tribe. Why would that be so? Why not language also under one-party rule? And the answer is that under a multi-party system, they had to elect a constituency representative, let's say an MLA, as well as a president. This meant that the political arena was national and the larger identification language made sense. Under one party system, only the constituency representative, only the MLA was to be elected, not the president. So, um, the political arena was reduced to the constituency level and the smaller identification became more relevant. We'll look at how, what federalism did to India, Indian political arena a, a little later when we come to Indian examples. So, it is not, of course, the, the claim is not that Zambian identities change with the alt alteration of the party system, only how Zambians pick their identity, pitch which identity is salient at the time of voting. So tribe, they become very tribally conscious when they have to, they are in, in a one-party system and they don't have to elect the president, only the MLA. And language becomes decisive when they have to elect the president also. Hmm? You can say it makes sense, right? It makes sense. This is a, this is a, a fairly intuitive uh, argument, but, but it was not well known. and It was uh, not so clearly articulated until it was, it was proposed, it was made by by Posner. Posner also studied one more African case for which he is famous. Two tribal, case, two tribal groups, Chiwas and Tumbukas. Chiwas and Tumbukas are present both in Zambia and Malawi. So lines were drawn at the time of the departure of the, of the colonial master, lines were drawn and as is true in many parts of Asia as well, the, the Chuas and Tumbukas were split between Zambia and Malawi. In Malawi, these identities matter in politics, but not in Zambia. Why? And the argument is that the way the constituency divide up makes these identities politically marginal and group small in Zambia, but politically usable in Malawi. In Malawi, the way constituencies have been set up, the Chivas and the Tumbukas are quite large in East, East, East constituencies. Therefore, that identity becomes salient. Whereas, whereas in, in, in Zambia, the way constituencies are set up makes, makes these two groups very small. Therefore, it does not make sense to mobilize numbers because with such small numbers in each constituency, you wouldn't win. Right? You could, of course, if you constructed Zambia differently and these groups became big and sufficiently large number of constituencies, then they might start using the Chiva and Tumbuka identity as opposed to something else. Right? Now, um, in, the, in, uh, in David Layton's work, um, the question was, as the Soviet Union collapsed, Russians in Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, he found, were not willing to return to Russia. Very few did. A truly, a truly minuscule proportion of Russians in these three states, after they became independent, returned to Russia. A truly minuscule proportion. They also did not have con uh, with, uh, uh, conflict with titular nationality. Uh, those who studied Soviet Union understand the word titular nation. What is a, what is a titular nation? The dominant nation in that particular, what was the Soviet Republic earlier? So Latvians in Latvia 
Estonians in Estonia, Lithuanians in Lithuania, Kazakhs in Kazakhstan, Uzbeks in Uzbekistan, these were called titular nations. Right? There is a term that the Soviet nationality literature generated. So they did not have any conflict with the titular nationality, but learned the titular language. Hmm? In the end, they were, as this, when the surveys were conducted and ethnographic work was done, in the end, they were neither Russian nor titulars. And a new term emerged from this literature. They had a conglomerate identity. Conglomerate identity, they just call themselves, and they, in, in the interesting, in interesting Russian term for it, or, or Estonian term for it, Russian speakers in the new abroad. Neither Russian, nor Estonian, but Russian speaker in the near abroad, that's the term emerged. And that, that term basically represented a new category, or a category that became quite common, a conglomerate identity. Is there a, another such example? Yes, Hispanics in the United States. Hispanics are simply Spanish-speaking people in the United States. They could be from Argentina, they could be from Mexico, they could be from, from Costa Rica, from Guatemala, hmm? and they, they, are, they have no connections, uh, or, or some of them have had historically a conflictual relationship in Central, Asia, Central America and Southern America, but here they, are, they, they constitute a category called Spanish, Hispanics, and they, are, they, they do not, they actually seek that, because Hispanics, that category is now 17% of the United States, bigger than the category African American. So it politically pays, and they see, and there are Hispanic conferences, there are Hispanic cultural movements, Hispanic dances, Hispanic, Hispanic um, um, there are so many Hispanic musicians, Jennifer Lopez, um, uh, uh, the man who sang uh, Li Living La Vida Luca. You know. Ricky Martin, right? They, so they are also on, uh, not only on the mainstream stage, but they especially attend the Hispanic cultural events uh, of significance. And they are not from the same place. So, so this term conglomerate identity is emerged as a result of the breakdown of the Soviet Union and emergence of new states and new political institutions. So now let's get into the Indian examples. Let's, or South Asian examples. What did the breakup of Pakistan do to identities? First start with, let's start with what was the basis for East Pakistan and West Pakistan to come together? Islam is the religion. Right? Once the, the nation was formed, Pakistan, what happened to East Pakistan? What kinds of issues started emerging? Islam was the basis, was the glue earlier. What happened when, they, when the nation was formed on the basis? So they say they were Muslims all right, but Muslimness cannot be equated with Urdu speaking. Right? Their Muslimness had a Bengali core. No Urdu core. Urdu was not their language. Urdu was not, they didn't think Urdu was the key ingredient of or defining feature of Islam. Right? Now, um, there was, of course, one more issue, which was very, this is also something institutional, you can reduce it to, but something very clearly, obviously, directly, manifestly institutional. East Pakistan, Mujib led Awami League, right? East Pakistan was numerically larger than all of West Pakistan combined. Right? And having won almost all seats of, of East Pakistan, almost all seats of East Pakistan, what, could, what, what was the claim of Mujibur Rahman or Awami League? That they should rule Pakistan. No party was larger than the Awami League in that election. And they, they should rule Pakistan. The counter argument was... Bangladesh was numerically larger, what came to be Bangladesh, East Pakistan was numerically larger, but West Pakistan had more seats. 
you can see right away an institutional clash. Right? You can see right away an institutional clash. Hmm? So Bangladesh also, one more argument was made that West Pakistan has four units and Bangladesh has one unit. Therefore, Bangladesh could, would be seen as one of five units of Pakistan. Right? Hmm? Now, all of these institutional questions, right? They, all of these institutional questions had very serious implications for how, you can see how identities were being linked to that. Right? The whole idea that Pakistan is four units, not one, and Bangladesh is one unit, out of, you know, uh, and, and, and one plus four is five, so its power should be one of five. Which finally led to the break of Pakistan. The institutional questions could not be resolved, the identities, right? Now, uh, and think of caste and electoral system. Is there any caste in India that can come to power on its own? Any caste anywhere in India that can come to power, even at the state level, national level, the answer is? Even at the state level. No caste in India, in any state, is more than 20. 22% of the Yerovas of Kerala. Caste-wise. There is no caste. Nadars are 11% of Tamil Nadu. Lingayats couldn't be more than 17-18%. Brahmins of UP, about 16%. Yadavas of UP about 10%, Yadavas of Bihar about 11%, Marathas of Maharashtra I think 23%, worth checking, Yedavas 22%, right? So, in an FPTP system, when it's a bilateral contest, then you would need close to 40 to 50% to win a seat. When it, even when it's multilateral contest, how many, you would need something like 30% to win which means you need to team up with some other caste. You need to team up with some other caste. Right? And that teaming up with some other caste can also lead, as was argued as early as 1960s, would lead to the formation of some new caste, caste identities, supra-caste identities. Right? The OBC category is one such. OBC category is entirely created by institutions of India. OBC category does not exist in, the, in Manusmriti. Does not exist. Right? It simply does not exist. OBC is an, an, a, a, a classification for created by India's political institutions and also made relevant to electoral politics. Otherwise, the category has no value. And the category has become quite important. There are many Yadavas who are willing to say in UP, Haryana and Bihar that they are OBC. This is not a category they used until 20 years ago. So they are Yadava and OBC. Hmm? They are, um, and now uh, even Jats are saying, Jats are not more than 4% of UP. Jats are saying they are Jats and OBC. A term they would not have used. Because OBC is a very important now category given the way Indian politics works. Right? So what is the what is the overall summary of what we are trying to do here? That political institutions, party systems, electoral institutions can begin to change the salience of identities. Are they making our identities? That is the question. Next question here. In this example, the famous example of language and tribe, is this about, the electoral system is creating identities or allowing you to pick one of your identities? What kind of claim is it? Creation of identities or picking one of your identities? And, and, and therefore, it's an argument about not identity creation, it's an argument about identity salience. Two different issues. Creation of identities versus salience of identity. What is it? 
In this example, and then you can, we can ask whether the identities have been created. In this example, this is about salience. Right? And the example of OBCs and Hispanics, both can take place. Creation as well as salience. Right? Though, if you say that we are both a Yadava and an OBC, you are also beginning to pick. However, OBC is an entirely new category. It just did not exist. Right? The, the first other backward classes commission, after, there was some, something in Mysore, if I, you know, which goes before 1947. The first other backward classes commission was created in the 1950s, which did not recommend that Delhi recognize OBC identities and give preference on that basis and, and also argued that the, what kinds of privileges, what kinds of preferences OBCs would have would be decided by the state, not by, by, by the state level of the polity, not by the national level of the polity. It is with the creation of the Mandal Commission and the acceptance of its recommendations in 1990 in Delhi that you began to get OBC as a very big category even beyond the south. On creation, on creation, here is uh, another twist in the literature. Venevra has posed the important question of whether identity choice can be so fluid if it formed or deepened by violent conflict, is Zambia an easy case? In Zambian history, is there anything like India's Hindu-Muslim violence at the time of partition? Malaysia's Malay-Chinese violence between 45 and 69. Sri Lanka's Sinhala-Tamil violence since 1977. And the several descents into ethnic warfare in the Balkans. Venevra claims that if violent conflict constructs or deepens identities, they cannot be easily bargained for electoral pragmatism. Is that right? So he's talking about not just, you know, certainly talking about creation, right? even salience, this would, this would affect. If, if, if violent conflict has, has created, constructed your identity, if you still, if 1947 partition violence shaped you, right? then is it possible, is it easy to change that identity? Or, this is, this is the question he's asking. You can also ask this question about if master narratives have created certain identities, for whatever reason. Is it easy to create, change that identity? What is the answer? He's saying it's not easy to change identity. 